From the fish in the oceans, to the waves on our beaches, to the birds in the sky, and to the animals in the jungles and forests, the moon has always worked hard to make life on this planet possible. So what do we do with the miraculous celestial body that helps maintain our planet's delicate balance? We make plans to land on it, mine it, and cash in on every valuable morsel we can get our spacesuit covered hands on, of course. But how will ambitious nations and private megacorporations look to make big bank by digging up moon rocks? And what up there has scientists and billionaires buzzing? Let's find out. Welcome to Space Greed. Many scientists believe that the moon was once a part of Earth itself, and then about 4.5 billion years ago, a Mars-sized planet crashed into it, launching millions of tons of debris into orbit. That debris would one day coalesce under its own weight and become Luna, our moon. The moon acts like a stabilizer, steadying the Earth's wobble, creating seasons, and keeping our planet's orbit around the sun slightly elliptical and very stable. And if that wasn't enough, our obsession with space travel began, of course, with the legendary space race to the moon between two world powers. There are several lucrative financial motivations for us to make the intense and expensive effort of returning to the moon. There's a loose legal framework that says people, corporations, or nations can't own the moon outright. But the recently signed Artemis Accords and even a presidential executive order have set the tone for a near future. The Artemis Accords, signed in 2020, is the political commitment between the nations participating in the American-led Artemis program, NASA's effort to return humans to the moon by 2024. The Accords and NASA's program make it clear we are heading towards a future where individuals and countries will have the legal authority to engage in commercial exploration, recovery, and the use of all resources found in outer space. In other words, the legal opportunity to cash in on space and whatever resources we find up there. And if we're finally able to extract resources from celestial bodies for non-scientific purposes, aka cash money, then there's one body, about 238,855 miles away, that scientists and billionaires have been drooling over. The Moon. Financial motivations for mining the moon almost all relate to how expensive it is to get things into space. NASA spends around $22,000 to launch a kilogram into low Earth orbit. A 16-ounce water bottle then would cost $11,000. Elon Musk claims SpaceX can do it for $2,700. Some experts predict that $1,000 per kilogram launch prices are on the horizon, and those prices are trending in the right direction, but are still a little high when you think of how many water bottles an average trip into space would require. But until we get to that point, just like when you travel with your family, it's best to pack light. The moon represents a prime opportunity to get our hands on the resources we would need to survive in space without having to pay for that extra checked baggage. So let's see what's all up there and why we will need it. The moon may not seem particularly damp, but scientists have found water in moon rocks obtained by the Apollo missions and have also detected H2O from infrared telescopes, lunar impactors, and orbiting spacecraft. Water is also a crucial ingredient in rocket fuel, a very special recipe involving liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. And you don't need to be an award-winning chemist to know that water, H2O, contains both hydrogen and oxygen atoms. Scientists estimate that between 100 million and 1 billion metric tons of ice are buried in the oldest regions at each of the moon's poles. That brings us to the second core motivation for mining the moon, rare earth metals. The moon's regolith, aka the layer of unconsolidated debris on the moon's surface, is thought to have, as of yet, unclaimed deposits of titanium, aluminum, and other valuable resources. Resources that can be used to make radiation protection barrier shields, landing pads, habitats, and other crucial structures. And possibly the most civilization-changing reason to mine the moon, fusion power. That's because the moon is rich in helium-3, a radioactive isotope of helium that contains an extra neutron. It's being called the perfect fuel by scientists. Too bad we have to go to the moon to acquire it. 
You see, helium-3 isotopes are very hard to come by here on Earth, but they are very abundant on the Moon. The lunar regolith is perfect for absorbing all that solar radiation cast off by our Sun. And after being bombarded by solar radiation for over 4 billion years, the Moon has absorbed an incredible amount of helium-3. There's at least 2.469 million metric tons of helium-3 on the Moon. And unlike with other nuclear fuels, a helium-3 reactor would use fusion, which generates energy by combining atomic nuclei, instead of splitting them apart, as in fission. It's the same process that powers the sun and going fusion instead of fission would produce very little nuclear waste or radioactivity. But the mission only produces a net profit in the best case, and only for medium to large scale operations, requiring a very large initial investment. So only some big players with big money backing them will end up sitting and salivating at this table. So you want to loot the moon? Here's how you do it. First things first, you're going to need water. And so far, the science says that most of the moon's water can be found in what are known as permanently shadowed regions. Doing so would require an external energy source because, as you've guessed it, there's not much solar energy on the dark side of the moon. One way to get around this need for energy, and probably the most aggressive approach, would be to strip mine the dark side of the moon, dragging that regolith and other chunks of rock into non-shadowed regions. But luckily for us, the process of producing helium-3 from the moon's dusty regolith also produces very large quantities of valuable water, hydrogen, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen. Helium-3 is the perfect fuel, and it gives us all this bonus gas and water. So let's focus on how an ambitious mining operation could harvest it all. Scientists and researchers have explored several methods, processes, and equipment types for getting at that helium-3 and other solar wind particles found on the lunar surface. But once that helium-3 is processed, we'll have to change gears to figure out how we can make use of it. And it's expensive to leave Earth and the return trip is not much cheaper. So transporting all that processed helium-3 back to Earth would definitely be resource, cost, and time intensive. But there's a better option. We don't need helium-3 as much as we need the energy it can generate. So let's just send the energy. Helium-3 is being touted as the perfect fuel because it's a clean, high-octane fuel, one that can be used to generate electricity without producing greenhouse gases or long-lived waste. But to make mining the moon for helium-3 make sense, we'd have to be able to build a working helium-3 reactor on the moon which is no small feat. But afterwards, we'd be able to send all that fresh juice back to Earth via coherent beams. The advantage of using coherent beams to send the energy is that they're tunable, highly directional, and can travel through the hardest vacuum for most of the trip. Another use for that processed helium-3 is to make rocket fuel. Deuterium helium-3 technology is what scientists believe will allow humanity to travel in our solar system and beyond. Using deuterium and helium-3 to power what's called a direct fusion drive would present some huge benefits for space exploration. It'd be faster and more powerful than any rocket in operation, and it would even allow for faster data transfer rates. We're talking about HD quality video from somewhere as far away as Pluto. The hope is we'll be able to harness fusion, the power of the stars, inside of the next few decades. The positive benefits of using lunar helium and Earth-based fusion plants, the reduction of radioactive waste, greenhouse gases, and the mining for fossil fuels would have a major impact on the quality of life in the 21st century. But let's not forget, we're talking about building a cutting edge, thus far mostly theoretical, fusion reactor on the moon. We're talking about a thermonuclear reaction that can only happen at extremely high temperatures and pressures. It's a precarious situation on Earth with ideal conditions, but life on the moon is even less predictable. There are moonquakes to deal with. First, you have deep moonquakes. These happen about 700 kilometers below the surface and are probably caused by tides. Then there's thermoquakes, caused by the frigid crust expanding after the first bit of warm illumination from the morning sun after two weeks of deep lunar freeze. And then there's shallow moonquakes. These ring off only 20 or 30 kilometers below the surface. Without oceans, like on Earth, to dampen the ringing, seismic events on the moon are much longer than on Earth, with most of them lasting for over 10 minutes. Any structures we build would have to be made out of flexible material so that no cracks develop. How long could buildings on the moon last with all that endless bending and shaking of persistent moonquakes? 
any structure we make on the moon would also have to be ready to deal with meteorite impacts, as the moon is hit with about 2,800 kilograms of asteroid mass every day. Now imagine your classic large musket ball with a mass of about 28 grams, and now imagine about 100,000 of them raining down on the moon every 24 hours. Now it's a big moon with a surface area of about 37.9 million square kilometers. 100,000 musket ball sized meteorites falling over an area that large. The odds are one musket ball will hit every 379 square kilometers. Now the odds aren't terrible, but living on the moon, building and maintaining some cutting edge fusion technology isn't easy. And relatively unpredictable meteorite impacts raining down from above doesn't make it any easier. What if an uncontrolled space rock pierces something important, like a high pressure containment cell, or one of the high pressure canisters of flammable gas? There's so many unknowns with the concept of fusion, let alone fusion in near zero gravity on the moon. All it would take is a major accident on the lunar surface to have long-term effects on the moon and, of course, life on Earth. The prospect of mining the moon for helium-3 is exciting and seems like the future that we're heading for, but there have been many times down here on Earth where we have bitten off more than we could chew. Once we start to play around with the celestial bodies of our solar system, there's potential for some serious and long-lasting consequences. And until then, I wouldn't be surprised if there was big money to be made in just getting to the moon early and squatting on a few square kilometers of lunar property. All that helium-3 on the moon isn't just going to blow away or anything. For more videos like this, be sure to subscribe to this channel right now, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any great content. And look out for curiosity stream on social media. Links are in the description.